What's going on, everybody, and welcome to the first installment of our NBA Prospect Series. You are watching or listening to Time Out with Doc and Caveman. This is our first episode that we're doing under our rebranded name. We did this series. We did uh, 20 prospects last season. We're going to aim for doing 20 again this year, possibly more if we have time. But the NBA draft is right around the corner. And we looked at the calendar. We said, holy cow, the draft is uh, July 29th. We're going to have to get used to that new NBA calendar. So today, as you can see, I already have the clip rolling here in the background. But we're going to be talking about Isaiah Jackson, who is a center from Kentucky. 6'10", 205", 6'5", wingspan. Um, Pretty impressive season overall as a freshman. He led the SEC in blocks. He was 54% from the field, 70% from the free throw line. Average 8.4 points, 6.6 rebounds, 2.6 blocks, as I mentioned, led the SEC. And he only averaged 20 minutes played per game. So those stats mm-hmm. are fairly impressive considering yeah. the lack of minutes that he got. For $20. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, okay, man, kick it off here. What are your initial thoughts? Um, we'll go over strengths, weaknesses, ideal fit, NBA comparison. So let's talk mm-hmm. about uh, what do you like about Isaiah Jackson? Actually, you have a fun fact about him first. Yes, we have a fun fact. So for each of these... Uh, prospects that we're doing. I kind of had a little fun with it and just did a little digging and found an interesting fact about each one of them. So, Isaiah Jackson, uh, his favorite movie, and this is kind of fitting, his favorite movie is The Incredible Hulk. (laughs) Doesn't doesn't that make a lot of sense? It kind of does, and I think the most concerning part for me throughout these prospect profiles is going to be where you found this information, and I don't know if I want the answer to that, so. (laughs) (laughs) What? Moving on. Uh, You already said it. I think the biggest thing with Isaiah Jackson is his shot blocking ability. He might be the best uh, shot blocker in this draft class. You talked about he apps. You mentioned that he only played around 20 minutes a game. But if you take that block average per 40, he averages about five blocks per 40 minutes, which is which is just which is just incredible. Uh to have that kind of interior defense is gonna be great at the next level. And the other big thing that is really work is gonna work in his favor at the next level, being that a perimeter league. He is excellent at defending the perimeter for a big man. He moves his feet very well. You see a lot of big men, you know, sometimes are slow to get out there on the perimeter or they're not the greatest perimeter defenders, but he really knows how to defend a perimeter. And we know with today's NBA, that's going to be a huge uh, thing in his advantage. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be, we're starting kind of backwards here with some of these prospects. So the number one thing you're going to notice with, honestly, not as much as last year's class, but some of these guys are the definition of untapped potential. You're probably going to hear us refer to that in one way or another throughout a few episodes here, but he's kind of the definition of that for me. You love his athleticism. You can't teach that. He plays above the rim, as you see several times throughout these clips. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't have, which we'll talk about his weaknesses, his offensive game, I'm sure a little bit when we get to that, but I mean, he's athletic. He has a high motor, you know, I love my high energy, high intensity players. I think worst case scenario, you're looking at a guy that's going to be at least an effective rotational piece, just based on his effort and his energy and uh, his length too. I mean, those are all things that I think are incredibly challenging to teach somebody. And you mentioned it that athleticism and that length, when you can use that on the perimeter, that has a lot of value defensively. So I think a lot of his strengths really rely on his defensive versatility. He's definitely going to offer a lot of that than his athleticism and his motor. Uh, I think that's really where it lies. So 
We'll, ta- we'll go over to the weaknesses then, which I kind of already alluded to. So I guess I'll start this one off. Mm-hmm. But it's just his untapped offensive potential for me. When you watch him, almost every shot that he makes is a dunk. Uh, he's not very creative in the post. He doesn't have a great mid-range game. He doesn't have a great three-point game. Um, he could add a little bit of strength. You know, when you have a seven-foot-five wingspan and you're in the low 200s, you're going to need to add a little bit of strength to be able to defend some of the bigger fours and fives in the league. They're just going to outmuscle them at that point. Um, that's not really an overly huge concern for me. You put some NBA conditioning and strength training, and that's something that's rectified fairly easily. But I think it's just refining that offensive game. That's going to be the difference to me, whether he's going to be a great mm-hmm. rotational defensive presence off the bench or is he going to develop into a, a solid starter or more? You know, there's some comparisons I'm sure we'll talk about. I always read to see what uh, other scouts and analysts say. And I read a few interesting comparisons, which I think are a, a little extreme. But uh, to me, it's a big weakness. It's going to be the deciding factor where he lands in this league is how his offensive game develops. Yeah, that's the biggest thing, you know, just with him is his he. He, I don't know if that's something he's going to try to work on at the next level because he didn't really show even, like, a willingness to have much of an offensive game in college. Uh, a couple other minor things besides that. He he gets called, and they're not going not gonna to see it with these highlights, but he gets called for a lot of legal screens, and that's just – that that's – that's that's the frustrating thing about him. It's just like knowing how knowing how to set screens, and it's just a it's just a fundamental thing. Uh, also on also he his footwork can use a little work. It all uh it leads to charge it. It leads to quite a few charges, uh, which is another thing that you know if. They're gonna try to draw charges on you all the time at the next level, as you see, as we know. So he's gonna really have to improve his footwork as well if he wants to uh, last at the next level and really stay out of foul trouble. Because otherwise, he's gonna be committing three or four offensive fouls a game, and that's not gonna really help you to last in the next level. Yeah, no, I mean, that's definitely not going to help you at all. So (laughs) let's head over to some ideal fits here based on some mocks that I've seen based on this draft class as a whole. I saw him go late teens. I saw him go in the 20s. I even saw him fall to the second round a few times. I I, think based on his athleticism. He has way too much to be a second round pick. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I mean... Whether you want to admit it or not, Kentucky's had a lot of success with their big men in the past, Mm -hmm. and I think that's definitely going to impact his draft stock. And you can take that for what it's worth. I don't necessarily like saying, you know, you hear that at the NFL a lot, like, oh, you know, Notre Dame doesn't develop quarterbacks. But, I mean, it's been the same. John Calipari has shown success with guards and big men. I mean, we've seen it time after time. He has an established program that's worked for many, many all-stars. So I think that's definitely in Isaiah Jackson's favor. So some of the fits that I have being uh, Oklahoma City has a lot of draft picks. So I think with, uh, you know, they have the 16th pick. You could see them. uh, They have several second round picks. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw them move up into the first round again as well with their second round picks. But I think uh, Oklahoma City gives him a chance to develop. There's not a lot of pressure on him to come in and be a solid starter. I mean, he would get minutes with Oklahoma City because they don't have the greatest roster. But I think that this is a chance that they can take on a guy like this, especially since they just traded Moises Brown. Uh, Moses Brown, sorry. Um, I thought he had some pot- Moises. Same thing. I was thinking, whatever. Never mind. Doesn't matter. But uh, Moses Brown has some potential. Uh, I liked what I saw from him last year, but they got rid of him in the Kemba deal. So I think that a guy like this could fill that role, that big man potential role. Um, I also had the Lakers and Clippers as well, who uh, mm-hmm. once again, it, it wouldn't offer him opportunity to get a ton of minutes in the beginning but it offers him a good opportunity to go to good defensive systems 
where he can sit on the bench and develop behind some really nice starters. Oh uh, yeah, those are a couple. Of, I I had uh, I had those guys down as well. I also have, and this is gonna be this is gonna be. I'm not gonna mention this team with pretty much every uh defensive big man. I'm gonna throw the Wizards out there. Uh, if there's one thing the Wizards need, especially inside, is a defensive anchor. Uh, at that four or five spot. I think he can if he if in terms of immediate impact, I think he could immediately come in to Washington if he were to get there and be a real solid contributor day one. Now is that great for his long term outlook? I don't know, but I think Washington is could could definitely use a a, a guy like Jackson. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Washington, anybody that plays defense uh, should go to anybody Washington. That plays defense. <laughs> I mean, they they will be a perfect fit in Washington. So a few NBA comparisons that I had. The one that I was alluding to earlier that I think is interesting. And at first I'm like, what are you crazy? But it was Bam from the Miami Heat. I saw a scout say that. I don't know if I'm crazy about that comparison, but I think people forget what Bam was at Kentucky. Uh, He wasn't the playmaker that we know him to be now. He didn't really show a lot of that playmaking ability at Kentucky. So similar, he had a very raw offensive game, similar to what Jackson's coming into the league like. So it's, but you've seen that tale at Kentucky two different ways. We've seen Bam and we've also seen Willie Cauley-Stein. So whether or not he develops uh, is the difference of a Jackson still becoming. Willie Cauley Stein, George. Uh, Willie Cauley Stein is done, and I loved Willie Cauley Stein, and but I've given up on him. But I'm saying that's re- the reality, though. Whether or not he develops is the difference. Willie Cauley Stein's played off the bench, and he's still in the NBA, and he's been a rotational piece. But really, whether or not he develops is the difference between him being Willie Cauley Stein or uh, or Bam. So. Uh, I thought that was interesting to at least know mm-hmm. other Kentucky big man that I, I didn't see anyone else say this one, but I personally like it. And it's one of the first names that came to mind for me. Um, Nerland's Noel, who's kind of filled mm-hmm. out a role in the NBA with being a great shot blocker. He was top five in the NBA in shots blocked last year. He hasn't once again, defi- or, uh, he has never found that offensive potential, but he's still a great defender and he offers a lot of value in that regard. And another guy is Chris Boucher from the, uh, the Toronto Raptors, another yep. guy top five in blocks last season hasn't really been great offensively for the Raptors, but he still is a great rotational piece. And for me, I, you know, and you kind of mentioned it. Isaiah didn't really show any willingness to take his offensive game further. Not to say he's still young. He's not 20 years old, so he can develop or he'll be 20 years old by the time the season rolls around. So not to say he can't develop that game, but that's, I would bank bank on it. So, yeah, I think that's the thing. If you're I think he's set up in a good spot because if his biggest and his we know his biggest weakness is his lack of offensive game that's something that can be developed Mm -hmm. and that he can let not not saying next season he's going to be popping threes because i don't see that happening but uh i think an offensive game is something that you can actually develop and work on uh i have uh, my guys are kind of middle to your guy uh nicholas claxton of uh brooklyn i think in terms of they're both lawn athletic defenders with a high motor you see nick you see whenever nicholas claxton enters a game for brooklyn it's like instant energy off the bench and i think the worst case scenario that's what isaiah jackson becomes is just a guy coming off the bench that gives you some instant energy and some solid interior defense off the bench and also uh i see some kenneth Fareed. now he's a bit longer and more uh athletic than kenneth Fareed, but another one just in terms of his high motor and excellent shot blocking ability kenneth Fareed also never really had much of an offensive game either so so yeah those are two of the those are two more of his like 
Wars, I think if he ends up being Nicholas Claxton, I think you I don't think you can complain too much about that. Yeah, no, especially for where he's being drafted. He's being drafted mm-hmm. to where if he just becomes a rotational piece, you're happy with that pick at the end of the day. You're talking playoff teams that are looking to solidify their roster. And, uh, you know, if he lives up to that potential someday. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think that's all that we have here for Isaiah Jackson. Tune in to the next episode of Time Out with Doc and Caveman, where we will be talking about one of Caveman's favorite prospects next. So tune in for that one, and we'll see you guys then. Yep.